Heavenly Father, as we, as we open your word, uh, we do ask that you would go before us, um, that you would uh, speak through me, and that you would make things uh, clear uh, as I try to communicate them. And we thank you for these folks. We thank you for their lives, for their testimony. We thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. Um, we don't take that for granted. And uh, we, are, we are truly blessed to live in this country, even with its faults. Um, we are grateful for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for this time together. We pray that you would use it to strengthen us, to encourage us, that we would grow in our love and our appreciation and in our walk with you, and that you would help us uh, to gain some insight into your plan and program for the ages and the consummation of the ages, uh, which we believe is not too far off. Um, so we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As I was contemplating over the last couple of weeks what I would like to address uh, to you in this session and cover in this session, uh, my mind went to a lot of different things. We kind of finished up, uh, at least for the time being, uh, issues related to the empire of the Antichrist, uh, the empires through history, and I really wanted to uh, go into a different, a different area, uh, but something related uh, and, cr and critically important. And I, I came back to something that I really haven't specifically taught on before, but I talk about all the time. And uh, I, I felt that it was something tremendously valuable. Let me elaborate a little bit. When I have people come up to me over the last 30 years, and they ask questions about the last days. They ask questions about the Lord's return. They ask questions about the timing, uh, the sequence, the chronology of Christ's coming. I always end up going back to what I believe is a core issue in terms of if you want to get the sequence, the chronology of the last days, I believe biblically correct. Doesn't mean I have all the I's dotted and T's crossed, but I, I do believe that if you go back to this core issue and you understand this core issue, this theme, that is prevalent throughout the scriptures and yet you almost never hear spoken of. I cannot remember, other than here, and I'm not saying it to be braggadocious in regard to our ministry, I cannot remember going into a church and, and hearing a message about this topic that we're going to address with you this morning. And the topic is the day of the Lord. Now, maybe your experience has been different than mine, but I have very, almost never, I can't remember a time when I've gone into a church and heard a message about the day of the Lord and the significance of the day of the Lord. But I am here to tell you this morning that this is a theme that has been addressed throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, repeatedly, and yet it is so often ignored within our churches today. And so I, I want to talk to you today about the day of the Lord and I don't want to assume, I know a lot of you have heard the term, if you've been coming to the sessions that we have here, you're familiar with the concept of the day of the Lord. But I, I want to go back and I want to go just to the core issue of what is the day of the Lord. So I'm going to give you an overview of where we're going. So again, if I lose you at any point, you, you, you're off the train, you can hop back onto the train because you know where we're going. We are going to be going back to the Old Testament. And we're going to be looking at the day of the Lord specifically in relation to the prophets of old and what they have said about the day of the Lord. And then, Lord willing, we're going to be making our way into the New Testament and hearing what some of the writers of the New Testament have to say about the day of the Lord. I don't expect that we're going to finish up the study today. We're meeting again in two weeks. Uh, so uh, uh, at least I'll be teaching in two weeks. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to continue on at that time. So I want to start with the day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? In, an, in a nutshell, the day of the Lord is, well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not referring specifically to Sunday, okay? It's not referring to Sunday. Uh, it's a term that's not used to talk about necessarily the Sabbath. It's, 
it is a term that is used that is prevalent and prominent in particularly the minor prophets. And I don't say minor because they're not important. Their books are shorter uh, in length. And um, many of these, pro probably at least nine, maybe more, maybe they don't use the term day of the Lord specifically, but they're writing about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the end times wrath of God. When, when God pours out his fury on a wicked, unrepentant world at the last days. When the cup of man's iniquity is full and God says a righteous, holy God says enough is enough. That's it. That's the end. I am going to vindicate my name among the nations with my people Israel and I'm going to judge the world for its wickedness. And it is an awesome, awesome period of time. Not long in duration, but an awesome time where God judges the world. So we're going to go back and look at a few passages because I'm hoping that as we move through quickly in some of these passages, you'll get a real sense of how significant this is, how important it is, and how prevalent it is within these Old Testament prophets and the words that they have written for us under divine inspiration. So the day of the Lord. Let's go back to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be touching on a lot of different passages. We're going to be jumping around, but hopefully you'll be able to stay with me. Um, if you have your mobile devices, feel free to use those as well. Although I'd love to hear the pages turning if you have a print Bible in front of you. Let's go to the book of Isaiah in chapter 2. And we're going to just move through some of these passages quickly, but I want you to get a real sense of the anger, the, the fury, righteous wrath of the sovereign God of the universe. Isaiah 2, verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower and every fenced wall. Did you notice thus far it's all about bringing down the prideful, the haughty. Verse 16, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, this is, these are the merchants of the world, upon all the pleasant pictures, and the loftiness, here it is again, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. This is a, an incredible summary of why the Lord is doing this. He's saying the haughtiness of humanity, the sin of humanity, the wicked pride of humanity has reached its, its epic threshold and God says, I'm going to bring it all low. I'm going to destroy it all, and I will be exalted to my rightful place within the nations. Verse 19, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Go over to Isaiah chapter 13, if you will. Verse 4, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. Now, it's important for you to understand as we talk about these and we read more of these passages, there is a recurring theme among all of these prophets, and that is this. They are prophesying, they are giving a word of the Lord to God's people. They're giving a word of the Lord to Israel. And the recurring theme through many of these Old Testament prophets is that Israel, you have turned your back on God. You have turned your back on the one who created you, who gave you life, who gave you sustenance, who fought your battles, who is the one who provided for you. You have turned your back. You have abandoned your God, and there is divine judgment coming. Now remember, the prophets of old, they prophesied, and this is very important, they prophesied in a, with a near-term fulfillment and, in, and a long-term fulfillment. 
So as you're reading the prophets and you're reading about specific things that they're prophesying, most of the time, they have a near-term prophecy. In other words, it will be fulfilled in a short time. It's still prophetic at the time they wrote it, but it would, it would occur in a short period of time. And the people who they're addressing would understand that. However, there is a long-term end times fulfillment that most of the prophets had in view as they were prophesying. So when you read words like the day of the Lord, in that day, most of the time when you're reading those phrases, it is referring to an ultimate end times fulfillment of the prophetic words that are being uttered by the prophets. So it's important as we're looking. And also, God is, is saying through his prophets, Israel, you've turned your back on me, and in an ultimate sense, I'm going to judge you. Now, he judged them through history. They were taken into captivity. There were marching armies that came in to conquer them. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of challenges that Israel faced where God was chastising them and punishing them in the near term. But there is an ultimate end times punishment that is coming, and it is coming upon the entire world. And it is not just coming for the Gentile nations who were the enemies of Israel through history. It is also coming to Israel. And the prophets are telling the people of Israel who have turned their back on God, there's going to be a near-term judgment upon you in many instances. But there is an ultimate end times judgment coming and you will not escape it unless you are among the remnant of faithful who will continue to uphold your faith in the one true and living God. So you have to understand this is the context. So when the prophets are writing here, there's a near-term fulfillment, and then there's a long-term fulfillment, usually connected to words associated with the day of the Lord or in that day. Okay, so you'll see those things over and over again. And if the Lord is doing the judging in this final analysis, in an ultimate sense, how is he doing the judging? In most instances, when we're talking about the last days, he's going to be bringing nations, using the Gentile nations around Israel to come up against them, and he's using them. They're, they're, they're the, in the rod, the rod of God's hand. He's using these nations. He's pulling them in specific passages in the Old Testament. God himself, he says, I'm putting hooks in their jaws, and I'm pulling them towards Jerusalem. Why? Because he is punishing not only the nations, but he is punishing his unfaithful people in Israel. Amen. So, verse 4 of Isaiah 13, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. Did you see that? Nations are being drawn and it is God himself who is mustering the armies, who is bringing them. Verse 5, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation. You see that? These armies are the weapons of God's indignation, his fury against his people to destroy the whole land. Verse 6, howl ye for the, here it is, the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. It's coming from God himself. Verse 7, Therefore shall all hands be faint. Every man's heart shall melt. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Verse 11, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud. There it is again. The proud to cease. I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. In other words, death and destruction all over the globe, centered in Israel. Look, if you will, at Isaiah chapter 34, verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear, 
And hearken, ye people, let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Listen to this graphic language. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. What a graphic depiction. Skip down to verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Verse 9, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. Verse 10, It shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie in waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Very, very graphic, sobering language. Skip over to Isaiah chapter 63. This, this is an amazing chapter from the standpoint that what Isaiah is writing, he's writing almost in the person of Jesus Christ himself, but it is Jesus Christ, not little Jesus, meek and mild, when he came the first time to be born in the little village of Bethlehem in a manger. This is Jesus divine king or warrior king the warrior king when he returns the second time and he will remember folks when jesus christ returns the second time he is physically coming to the earth he is the god man he was born of a human he is divine and he is human 100 percent god 100 percent man When he returns, he is returning to the earth physically, literally, to a real place, to a real city, Israel and Jerusalem, to be the king of the earth for a thousand years, literally, literally. So when we read this passage, this is the discussion that Isaiah is almost putting himself in the the mouth of of Jesus Christ himself, the words that he's he's, he's, uh, prophesying here of what Jesus is saying when he's here as the warrior king walking on the earth. Look at what it says in Isaiah 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments? He's asking the question of who it is from Basra. Where's Edom in Basra? Edom across the Jordan, east of Israel, east of Jerusalem, which would in today be modern day Jordan, okay? Southern Jordan, Edom. In other studies, we may, we may spend a little bit more time on it, or a lot more time on it. Very significant where Jesus Christ is. So do you notice, this is not just figurative. Jesus Christ literally, now this may come as a shock to some of you, he literally will be on the earth, and he literally will be leading a great processional through the desert on his way to Jerusalem when he comes a second time. Amazing. It's a whole other study, but... Maybe we'll cover it in the days ahead. So who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? That's also an Edom, like it was a capital or a major city within Edom in historic times. That this is this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Whereof art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? In other words, He's glorious in his apparel, this one who's coming through the wilderness, through the desert. But it's like he's been trampling on the grapes of an ancient wine press, where you trample the grapes and the juice splashes up on the robe and stains the robe. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled or splattered up upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. Once again, not little Jesus meek and mild. 
Jesus as the warrior king, judging the nations. Verse 4, Isaiah 63. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation, his right arm of power. God did it himself through Jesus Christ, his son, the warrior king. Salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. Righteous indignation. Verse 6, and I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Turn over, if you will, to Joel chapter 1, a little bit further on in the Old Testament. Very short book, but a very powerful book. What does Joel have to say? about the day of the Lord. Quite a bit, but we're only just going to touch on a few verses here. Joel chapter 1, verse 14. And again, this is in the context of proclaiming what is coming to Israel, the judgment that will befall Israel, particularly in the last days. Verse 14, sanctify ye a fast, he says to to Israel. Call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, Jerusalem. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh or near at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. God is judging the nations, and he is pouring out judgment on Israel for their unfaithfulness to him. Look, if you will, at Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 15. When was the last time you were in Obadiah? (laughs) Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Don't think pagan, wicked, evil nations that treated Israel wrongly, don't think that you're going to get away with it. What you've done, it's going to come back on your head. Verse 16, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow it down, and they shall be as though they had not been, that they had never existed. In other words, they're going to drink of the cup of God's divine wrath. They may try to refuse it, and God says, nope, you'll drink it all right. You're going to experience my wrath. Turn over, if you will, to Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. Almost the, the, the idea is be quiet, be silent for the awesomeness of what is about to occur on the earth. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. In other words, he's prepared a sacrifice and he's calling the nations to Jerusalem. He's got a trap set for them. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Look at verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. Verse 17, and I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither shall neither their silver 
nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. They can say, oh, the rich can say, oh, I'm okay. I've got wealth. I can buy my way out of this. God says, no, no. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Skip over to Zephaniah 3, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations. Do you see that again? Recurring theme. He's gathering the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So let's just take a quick review as we go through about 10 bullet points of what the day of the Lord comprises from according to what the Old Testament writers have to say. We'll take a quick brief look through. Brief descriptions of the day of the Lord. What we just read in summary. It is a time when God ariseth to shake terribly the earth. A time of destruction from the Almighty. A time of divine wrath and fierce anger. A time when God will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. A time when God's indignation and fury will be directed against the nations. A time when God's vengeance will be revealed. A time of darkness in the heavens. A time of fire from the Lord. A time of clouds, thick darkness, gloominess, wrath, trouble, distress, and terror. A time of darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. Did you get that? This is from Amos. We didn't even, we didn't even read from Amos. There are other passages of scripture, many that we, that we skipped over. A time of darkness, the day of the Lord, not light, even very dark. He says, isn't it a time of darkness and there's no light in it? He's saying, yes, there is no light in it. It's a time of darkness, no brightness, in it. So you can see it is a dire situation. This is the this is sinners in the hands of an angry God, and God is going to judge the nations. So we've heard what the Old Testament writers have to say. The dire prediction, the dire prophecies of what is coming on the earth. The question is, is there anything else we can learn about the day of the Lord? Well, we can. Let's go to the New Testament apostles and see what they have to say about the day of the Lord because I know I can smell the wood burning you all have questions as to okay if there's this dire these dire prophecies that are such a recurring theme in the Old Testament and it's it's so important and this is the time when divinity is going to be invading humanity and judging the nations when is it where is it what's connected to it what else can we know about it it's crucial let's see what the Apostle Peter has to say about the day of the Lord turn if you will to 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, I want to give you some background, some context. Most likely, Peter is writing this epistle from Rome. He's writing it at the time of Nero, who is in power, Emperor Nero, who is a, had a terrible reputation for being uh, violent, murdered lots of Christians, uh, terrible things that he did. So this is the timing where Peter is, is writing, most likely from Rome, um, and he's addressing this to a general audience in Asia Minor. So the, the book he's writing, uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, he's writing it to, to an audience in Asia Minor, which, where is Asia Minor today? Western Turkey, Western Turkey, okay? So for instance, like the area of Istanbul, Turkey, and south along the Aegean Sea. So he's writing it to a general audience of new believers, and false teaching has crept in, uh, and so he's, he's giving them warning, and he's addressing some very important concerns. So in chapter 3, verse 1, Peter says, The second epistle, beloved, and I now write to you, in both which I stir up your pure minds, 
by way of remembrance. So I'm trying to stir up your, your thinking or your remembrance about some important issues. Verse two, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Did you get that? So Peter's saying, folks, to my audience in Asia Minor, believers struggling, there's false teaching going on. I want to remind you of what the prophets of old, your own Old Testament prophets of Israel, what did they say? What did they say? Verse three, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming, of Christ's coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. In other words, they're scoffing. They're saying, yeah, we've heard about this Christ's coming. It's, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Everything's, everything's continuing on. People live, people die through history. Where's the promise of, of his coming? Verse 5. Peter says, for this they, the scoffers, willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. In other words, God created the world, and the land area is the water. Verse 6, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So do you hear what Peter is saying? He's reminding them. He's saying, God created the, the earth, the land, the sea. The scoffers come along and they say, ah, where's the promise of his coming? Nothing's going to change. He's, he's not coming. And Peter says, ah, but remember, there were scoffers. Noah was building an ark. 120 years, people said, ah, you're crazy. Who's this talking about God intervening and, and judging the world? That's crazy. And what does Peter remind them? Whereby the world that then was, was overflowed with water and perished. And the, in other words, God destroyed the world by flood. Deity invaded humanity. Deity invaded humanity. When humanity said, no, nothing's going to happen, God intervened in the affairs of men and destroyed the world by flood, except for Noah, his three sons, and three daughters-in-law. Verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. In other words, they're held, reserved unto what? Fire. Fire. Against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So now listen, it's very important. What Peter is saying is, look, the people who are scoffing and saying, oh, what are you talking about? That, that there's going to be, deity is going to invade humanity and judge the world. That, that Christ is going to return. And Peter says, ah, uh -uh. remember, historically, when God did intervene in the affairs of humanity, he did judge the world by water, by flood. And now he's held it in store, the earth in his hand, reserving it for another divine intervention, only this time by fire. And that fire is connected to the day of the Lord that we just read about in the Old Testament. And he goes on to say, it, God's timing is not our timing. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. He has his own timing. He's not slack. In other words, it, God hasn't said, oh, you know, well, you know, maybe I'll just... No, there's a plan and a program. And when it is the proper time, the Lord will bring about his judgment. But he, he, he delays because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's the mercy of God in the midst of the righteous indignation that we're going to be reading about and that we read about earlier. There's mercy because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. How many of you heard that before? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Okay? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, 
and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Here's by fire, right? The flood was by water. This second time God intervenes, to judge humanity will be by fire. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Do you see where this is all moving? This is all moving to God establishing righteousness on the earth, the way it was intended back in the Garden of Eden. Now, when you read in this passage, he says he's going to purge the world by fire. He's going to destroy the world by fire. When God destroyed the world the first time by water in the flood, was there still an earth afterwards? Sure there was. We're still living on it. The same is true when God destroys the world by fire, and there's a new heaven and a new earth. It's not new in origin. It's the same heaven and the same earth. It's new qualitatively. In other words, God is going to purge the earth of all that has defiled it. He is going to destroy the wicked. He is going to punish the nations. And he's going to purge the earth of everything that has defiled it and establish a righteous kingdom on the earth. So it's critically important to understand these things. By fire is what is coming. But go back to verse 10, if you will. And what does Peter say? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, folks, this is critically important. And this is where I started at the beginning of this presentation. That if you understand the day of the Lord, and I think if you understand it properly, biblically, it's going to help you tremendously to understand the sequence and chronology of end time events. Now, we haven't gotten into the timing of it yet, and Lord willing, in a few weeks we will. But I, want you, I wanted you to understand what it's about, what it is, and then when we get to here, what, is, what does Peter have to say? The day of the Lord, the same time period, this time of end times judgment that the Old Testament prophets talked about repeatedly, he says, it will come as a thief in the night. And folks, if you stop there, you don't have the full picture. You don't have the full picture. Peter is giving a lot of important, crucial, relevant information. But this specific issue, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, you could, you could close the Bible and say, we have no idea when it's coming. Nobody knows it's coming as a thief in the night, It'll be here when we don't expect it. We have no concept of when it's coming. But I want to take you to what the Apostle Paul has to say. So turn over, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul and the Day of the Lord. Paul had just been to Thessalonica. Thessalonica is in northern Greece. It's still a city today, a large city in northern Greece on the Aegean Sea. He was in Thessalonica, and then he made his way, and there was a kind of a, he established a, a, a new church, struggling church, um, and he had moved on to the area of Corinth, which is in southern Greece today. There are approximately, the distance between Corinth and Thessalonica is about 330 miles or so. And um, so he's in Corinth, and he sends uh, Timothy back to Thessalonica because he wants to make sure that the church that he established in Thessalonica is strong and moving on in the Lord. And he wants to address some important issues with them. And he sends this letter. He writes this letter. Verse 13. Let's go back to chapter 4, verse 13. First Thessalonians. And Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, 
that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now when Paul says, behold, I would not have you to be ignorant, it doesn't mean that the people were dumb or stupid. It means that they were thinking wrongly about a specific issue. And Paul, in his letter, is trying to address this to the Thessalonian believers. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant or think wrongly about this, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or those who have died, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. In other words, the blessed hope. So what was, what was happening is that there was teaching going on, or people uh, thinking wrongly, about those of their loved ones who had died, and there was a concern or a fear that those loved ones that had died would miss the blessed hope of the return of Jesus Christ. So he's trying to correct their theology. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep, those who have died in Jesus Christ, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or go before them which are asleep. In other words, those of us who are still alive at the time of Christ's return, we're not going to go first. The dead in Christ, your loved ones, those you care about who passed on, they're, if they're dead in Christ, they're going to rise first. And then those of us, us who are still alive will be caught up to be with them in the clouds. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Remember, this is the warrior king. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a wondrous passage of scripture this is. As a comfort to those of us who have had loved ones and friends who passed on, who were in Christ, um, we know that they have not missed out on the blessed hope, that they will be resurrected before those, if we are alive, before those of us who are still alive and remain are caught up to be with the Lord. It says, verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. But now we get to the passage related to specifically what we're talking about. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, same audience he's writing to, Thessalonica, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Here it is again. Very similar to what Peter had to say to his audience in Asia Minor, right across the Aegean. So Thessalonica is on the western side of the Aegean Sea. That's where Paul is writing his letter to the Thessalonians. And just across on the eastern side of the Aegean Sea is the area today of Turkey. And that's where Peter was addressing his letter in 2 Peter. But what, is, what does Paul say? For yourselves know perfectly. So in the, in the previous instance, they were, they were confused. They weren't thinking correctly about the blessed hope that those who had died in Christ hadn't missed out on the blessed hope, that when the Lord returns in power and glory, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to be with them in the clouds. They were thinking incorrectly about that. But now when you get to chapter 5, it says, But at the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. You know this. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the time of God's, God's end times divine wrath, so cometh as a thief in the night. And if you stop there, you come to the same conclusion that you would have in terms of what you read about the thief in the night in Peter. However, he goes on. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, I want to call out to you a few things. Look at the pronouns in the verse that we just read. For when, who? They. Who are the they? The unsaved. The unsaved. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon, another pronoun, them, the unsaved, as travail upon a woman with child, and they, the unsaved, shall not escape. Now it changes, verse 4. But 
ye. Now, who is the ye? Believers. The believers that he's writing to. But ye, brethren, and look, don't you love the word but? Right? It's a, like about face, turn around. I have to give my dad credit for so much of the things that I'm teaching today. <laughs> he, he, I always remember listening to him uh, growing up and hearing him teach, and he taught on so many of these things, and, and I really have to credit him with so much of what I'm sharing this morning. Um, but uh, he loves, he loves the, the but, right? You get this whole, whole um, uh, flow of information, and all of a sudden the Apostle Paul says, but, boom, turn around about face, and he used to say that in his messages, so I guess uh, I picked up on that. But, but ye... Believers, brethren, are not in darkness that that day, what day? The day, of the, Lord. the day of the Lord. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Amen. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. And what a wondrous verse, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, Amen. but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did you get that verse? For God hath not appointed us to wrath. The connection is, remember, what is the term that we've been talking about this whole time that the Old Testament writers have used referring to God's end times judgment and his wrath? Amen. The day of the Lord. So that's the context that we're, that we're reading about here in Thessalonians. So he's saying, for God hath not appointed us as believers to that specific period of time when God will judge the world. We're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also ye do. There's going to be a time of severe righteous indignation. The fury will come up in passages of Scripture. The fury will come up in God's face. And it will be sinners in the hands of an angry God. However, however, for you, child of God, discerning child of God, you will know the general time period of these things. You're children of the light. You're not children of the darkness. And what's the point? The point is for discerning believers, they will know the general time period of Christ's return and his judgment upon the earth. For the unsaved, for the unsaved, they will be completely and utterly caught off guard, just as it was in the days of Noah. When divine judgment came and destroyed the world by flood, so divine judgment will come in the last days and destroy the sinners, the wicked, and purge the world by fire. Lord willing, the next time we meet, in two weeks from now, we'll continue with this and it gets even more exciting, I believe, because we're going to be looking at the Lord Jesus, His words, and the day of the Lord. Do the words of Jesus align, or I should say, do the words of the Old Testament prophets and the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul align with the words of Jesus Christ? Absolutely they do. And so the next time we'll be talking about that. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. 
Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.